bank. It's Orson Welles. Of course it is. I think it's time we talk. A few months ago, David Fincher released Mank, his first film on Netflix and his first film period in six years. On its opening day, I came to the decision to watch it in much the same way I watch most things on Netflix. I saw the trailer a couple days before it came out, and when I logged in that Friday and saw it in front of my face, I thought, it's a Fincher movie, why not? This is something I've done many times in my five plus years as a Netflix subscriber, and when I started to watch the movie, I didn't think anything about that was weird. But after I finished the movie, it occurred to me that Fincher himself is arguably the biggest reason why that subconscious reflex is so commonplace today. In 2013, his work on House of Cards paved the way for the platform to become a bellwether of entertainment, an unlikely development considering his prolific film output at the time. He had never made a TV show before, and he made his first one for a business that was caught between the past and future of home video. It's no secret that Cards has a complicated legacy for a number of reasons but it successfully molded the next age of TV in Fincher's image and took advantage of a form of consumption that was quietly becoming the norm. DVRs and DVD box sets made binging shows an informal pastime for many, including Fincher, who said he used his TiVo to catch up on Breaking Bad and The Sopranos. But when Netflix launched its instant streaming service in 2007, in response to the inevitable decline of DVD rentals, it was the first time entire seasons of shows were aggregated in one place for people to watch. In those first few years, the only shows available to stream were the property of other companies. But in 2011, Netflix announced it was going to make a loud and deliberate entry into originals. To do that, they decided to spend $100 million to make 26 episodes, or two seasons worth, of an American remake of the 1990 BBC miniseries, House of Cards. Choosing it to be the first Netflix original was a financially sound decision, since the political thriller genre, Fincher-directed movies, and Kevin Spacey starring films were popular viewing categories in the platform's early days. Since the company had no experience making an original, it gave Fincher and his team full creative control. And since they ordered two full seasons in advance, no pilot was necessary, enabling Fincher and head writer Bo Willimon to focus on making a show that took advantage of the batch release model. Because House of Cards would be the first show to release all of its episodes at once, a couple filmmaking aspects became more important than they usually are. The first one was creating a consistent visual style, and to do that, Fincher directed the first two episodes and applied his precise filmmaking style to TV. All of his hallmarks are there, like his preference for a tripod secured camera over handheld, the way his camera moves with the characters as they move, and his cold, steely color palette. But arguably the show's most influential stylistic decision was the emphasis on shallow focus shots like this one. While shallow focus was nothing new at the time, Fincher was able to combine it with his own sensibilities, and from there, the look of House of Cards became the standard Netflix has been following ever since. From serious dramas to stand-up comedy specials, Netflix has used this de facto house style to make its perpetually expanding roster of originals look cinematic across the board. In the case of Cards, the style suited a show depicting a vengeful, fourth-wall-breaking politician on the warpath. They also wanted to create a narrative that invited people to binge. There was no need for cliffhangers since people weren't going to have to wait around for more, so Willimon and Fincher could let episodes flow casually into each other, like a scene or act break in a movie. Making so-called 13-hour movies was what intrigued Fincher about working with Netflix in the first place. He's always been interested in the psychology of his viewers. I think people are perverts. And House of Cards had just as many sleazy characters and situations as any of his other projects. But Netflix made him consider a new side of that psychology, the act of consumption itself. He liked the idea of having a relationship with audiences beyond two hours and compared the binge-watching experience to reading a book. Netflix's interface satisfies that metaphor in different ways, like the resume playing feature that acts as a virtual bookmark. Ironically, the platform's success is a big reason why actual book readership is declining, making the metaphor Netflix is partly based on more and more obsolete. And when season one came out on February 1st, 2013, people flocked to see what the deal was with this web series. It became the first online-only show to receive an awards nomination of any kind, Fincher won an Emmy for the pilot, and Netflix became instantly reputable as a studio and not just a service. The impact of his approach to the show is widespread. He paved the way for mature narratives and elevated cinematography to thrive in a medium traditionally forced to tone things down. He also made Netflix a popular place for big names in front of and behind the camera. And that pseudo star system came to a head recently with this celebrity filled ad announcing the platform's intention to release a new movie every week this year. 
But in both the ways I just mentioned, Fincher may have done his future work a bit of a disservice. He set a standard of filmmaking precision that has been so widely emulated across streaming to the point where in some ways, it's harder for his own work to stand out. I think that might be why no studio besides Netflix has released a Fincher movie in seven years, and why his second Netflix series Mindhunter was put on hold after two seasons. But it could also be because the types of movies and shows he likes to make are narratively ambiguous and gray and not overtly grim like a Black Mirror, or at least the first few seasons of Black Mirror. Maybe that's why Mank was more sentimental than I expected, maybe starting to turn over a new leaf of some kind. But we might just chalk that up in the end to it being a Hollywood-focused movie written by his late father. Regardless of all this, David Fincher's impact on today's landscape can't be overstated. And the contract he recently signed with Netflix, as well as the frequent reappearances of his movies there, affirms that. He is the reason why streaming is as dominant as it is. And as the instigator of this movement, he knew better than anyone that the captive TV audience, the world of 7.30 on Tuesday nights, was dead. Hey guys, so first off, thank you so much for watching this and watching me get my David Fincher video essay quota out of the way. Uh, but in all seriousness, I thought this would be an interesting topic to dive into. I watched Cards back in college, and I remember being surprised at how cinematic it looked, and I wanted to take a look at what specifically made it so influential as the benchmark for the streaming world we're in now. I also wanted to thank those of you that have watched my other videos and subscribed over the past few months. I really appreciate all the awesome and flattering comments you guys have left, and I'm looking forward to giving you guys more stuff to watch. Uh, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you guys in the next one.